on the big screen today is Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 2, starring Chris Pratt and a host of other characters. Now, these hosts of characters include people such as Zoe Saldana, Bradley Cooper, even though you don't really see him, he's one of the animals, uh, Vin Diesel, uh, again, you know, he's one of the other creatures, and uh, Kurt Russell, who is not one of the other animals, but you'll find out later just who he really is. So anyway, this movie does a pretty good job of uh, introducing you to itself, even if you haven't seen any other adventures that this ragtag group fought, go into. And that was good for me, because actually I haven't seen the first one of these, and I know what you're thinking. Uh, Chris, what the, what the hell are you doing? Like, why would you not watch the first one? And I just haven't gotten around to it. I haven't gotten around to many movies. I haven't even seen the Avengers movies, for that matter. But, you know, I don't feel like it should be a prerequisite to go see this movie. And, thankfully, it was not a prerequisite. And neither was the second Avengers or any of the other Marvel movies, for that matter. And I felt that this movie did a good job in being self-contained. And that was a previous criticism I had with someone about this whole set of movies being made, kind of saying, well, is it going to be like homework? It's keeping track of who is who and what is what? Is it, is it going to be strenuous? I thought going to the movies should be a relaxing time, not a... I don't know, quiz on Saturday. You know, why would I want to take a quiz on Saturday? I've already been schooled out. Anyway, in short, the movie is solid. Uh, you don't need to watch the first one to know what's going on. Though I will definitely say that I picked up on things that I know I would have had more context if I had seen the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie. Kind of these... I don't know about Easter eggs as much as continuations from the first one saying what would have happened after this. Like if you're watching the first one and you're like, I wonder what happened to that guy. Or, huh, I wonder where they ended up. Or, are these two ever going to do anything? So, I feel like that this movie did a good job at answering some questions for bigwig fans. And I won't attest to any of the comic book adaptation aspects or you know did they go to the source material correctly because I haven't read it and I don't know offhand um I am interested in finding out though uh this movie did at least get me curious well what are the comics really like what what do they have in store how many adventures does this set of ragtag people come into and I keep saying ragtag but I don't really have a better way to describe it. I mean, you have this set of characters. Uh, you have a raccoon named Rocket, and that's where the Bradley Cooper comes in. You have this human, uh, played by Chris Pratt. He's kind of the center of the group, you could say. You have this uh, creature named Gamora. Uh, she's green, uh, played by Zoe Saldana. And... I kept thinking when they're saying her name, it was Gomorrah, like uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, like those cities in the Bible that were destroyed early on, like in Genesis or something. You know, don't quote me on that. But anyway, it was a pretty infamous city, and I was getting constantly thrown for a loop when they were saying her name was that. It's not spelled the same, though. Uh, you have this, well, they have baby Groot. I guess there's like a normal size Groot. He's like a tree. He keeps saying, I am Groot, which I guess he's the Chewbacca of this group in the sense that Chewbacca always roars and Harrison Ford would always answer him. Like, I know Chewie, uh, Groot is that character, except he's a baby in this movie. Uh, he's played by Vin Diesel. But you would have never known it was Vin Diesel, except that they told you it was Vin Diesel. So it kind of gives you that clue in, I guess, but, you know, I would have never known that otherwise. Uh, you have, uh, Kurt Russell's in this. Um, I know he was, you know, a big-time movie star really before my time, but 
Um, he's kind of the, I guess, big name for older people to come in. I did recognize Stan Lee in his cameo, as he's always known to do in these Marvel movies. That was cool. Um, and this movie did have the classic sense of uh, extra scenes after the credits had started. There were like three of them. Uh, none of them really felt... Well, one of them felt like it was sequel bait. The second one was kind of iffy uh, with Sylvester Stallone. Uh, that was one of the characters I didn't really know who he was because I didn't watch the first one or haven't read any of the source material. Um, I'm sure he's going to have a more important role and I'll probably watch the first one at some point soon so I have a better idea of who he is. Um, you have Stan Lee finished off his cameo with these guys that look like they're... Mm, I, I don't know, Star Trek impersonators or wearing the monolith from 2001 on their, on their necks. It's hard to say. So what actually happens in this movie? Well, you have this set of, you know, like a raccoon and a green lady and Chris Pratt and this guy who looks like the burned, like, like, like the fireball guy from Fantastic Four, you know, except he's all gray. You know, that kind of that kind of thing. He's all burnt and stuff. Like Drax is his name. And you have Rocket. Um, Rocket's pretty cool. You have uh, Yando, Yandu, um, who you find out later uh, in the movie, if you haven't seen any of this before, that he's the one that raised Chris Pratt. Uh, Kurt Russell is uh, the father of Chris Pratt's character. Uh, like the actual birth father of Chris Pratt's character. And so you have this story of Chris Pratt reconnecting with his father, but in a previous place where they were, they had done these things for the high priestess and they picked up their prize, which was Gamora's sister, and Gamora and her sister don't get along very well. And... Then you have Rocket stealing batteries because it's easy. You know, his words, not mine. Uh, you have this whole takedown of the high priestess or whatever, chasing after all of them. And then you go on and you, ha after some talk about Chris Pratt not knowing who his father is, was... Um, Someone saves this whole ragtag group and you're thinking, oh, who is it going to be? And I probably just wasn't awake enough in this movie yet. Um, not because the movie was boring, but just because I hadn't really put my gears in check yet in terms of looking for answers right away. Someone saves them and you're thinking, oh, who could this be? But, you know, of course they, you know, introduced a little bit about, you know, Chris Pratt not knowing who his father was. And so you start to think, oh, well... It's probably, you know, Chris Pratt's father. And that's who Kurt Russell's character is. And after the the Guardians, you know, go onto this planet, which is like Burhurt, which is like Herbert, but the H and B are flipped. It's a weird name, but okay. I'll take it. Uh, you have like almost like a mile's worth of foliage just cut down because the Guardians had a really bad landing. And then this other ship that had saved them uh lands near them and that's where Kurt Russell and his like pet alien or whatever you know come out of the spaceship and say hey Chris I'm your dad come follow me and you're like uh who is this guy what is going on here and it's a little weird uh because you think oh well you know it's his dad I mean this is gonna be some good time to figure out how they interact, you know, why he wasn't there for him, like why, you know, why Kurt Russell wasn't there for Chris Pratt, so on and so forth. And, of course, the, uh, Kurt Russell's name in this movie is Ego, and he has this whole, own um, planet. <laughs> okay. You, you know, I mean, I think the jokes write themselves there, and I don't feel like writing them, so there you go. Um, you have, like, Gantis, or, like, Mantis, I don't know. She has these, like, Antenna and uh, Drax, the the bodybuilder kind of guy. Uh, 
gets this uh, crush on her and she apparently can feel people's emotions and change people's emotions. And you have Gamora who keeps trying to deny that her and Chris Pratt are going to be an item. And she's also dealing with uh, her sister who is bloodthirsty for Gamora and wants her dead. Um, you have this raccoon who is called many, many things other than a raccoon. Uh, and yeah, I mean, you have an interesting group of characters and I think that's what I really liked about this movie. The character development. I like these guys. I wanted to know more about what they were going to do, like what pursuits they were going to have. I felt invested. I cared about what happened to them. I wanted to make sure that they were doing okay. Even, even if it does get a little schmaltzy and a little predictable, like, like you know that they're going to make it out somehow, some way. You, you know, you know that, but... Still, you're like, oh, no, like, don't, don't do that, guys. Like, or, uh, don't die on me now or anything like that. I mean, you're, you know what's going to happen, but you still feel drawn in as to what's going to happen to them. And this, this is where I'm going to get into spoilers here. So I'm just going to give you a spoilers warning right now. All right, so spoiler talk. Well, here's the deal. Kurt Russell ends up being this complete asshole, and he is the father of Chris Pratt, but Chris Pratt's mom had died of brain cancer, you see, and he, Pratt, had to deal with the loss of his mom. But what he finds out is that his dad, Kurt Russell, is the one that put the tumor in her brain that caused her to have cancer. He he killed he killed his mom. And on top of that, Kurt Russell's been like basically like getting it on with all kinds of species and banging them and having kids cuz he wants this big like celestial being to have control over everything in the universe and to have this light that just infects everything and overruns everything and has control over, well, guess what? Everything. So, I mean, that one threw me for a bit of a loop. I guess because the timing of it was sooner than I thought. You know, I kind of had a feeling that Kurt, Kurt Russell was up to something, but I didn't think it was going to happen that quick. I mean, it's not, it's not the first 10 minutes or anything, or even like the first 30, but it happens pretty soon within the movie in in relative terms I guess you could say I mean it feels like more than half an hour after you know the spoiler of you know, Kurt Russell is the most awful person ever um and really the big spoiler of that he killed he killed Chris Pratt's mom and he has all this fine wine talk about how Brandy is a fine girl and they keep playing that song and he breaks Chris Pratt's Walkman that he always had, and he, you know, pisses off Pratt, and Pratt has part of this celestial being in him because, you know, his father is Kurt Russell, and he has some of that power. And so, I was kind of thinking that somehow, if Kurt Russell had died, Chris Pratt would have died too. That's not really the case here. Uh, Chris Pratt does make it out in the end, which is good. I mean, I'd be kind of bummed if he didn't make it out. I mean, who would, they, who would they replace him with, you know? What other human character would they put in? It wouldn't be the same. You have Nebula, who's Gamora's sister. She has an interesting struggle. She's a complete, complete bitch in the first half, but not necessarily softens up, but understands her needs and doesn't kill her sister like she was bent on doing in the first half. So that was a plus. And she experiences some character growth and she expresses her doubts and her frustrations with Gamora. And you see Gamora in a different light. Gamora is not all perfect. You know, she seemed kind of a little snotty in the first place, but then you realize, oh man, like Gamora, you know, had some dark stuff going on. But you realize both of them 
had their faults and both of them had their pluses. Neither one of them was necessarily better than the other one. I, I mean, of course, okay, you know, Nebula was cast in the more negative light, obviously, in this movie, but not so much for Gamora. But Gamora wasn't such an angel either. I liked uh, the raccoon. He was he was pretty funny. I think one of the big things about this movie is that it got super meta super quick. Even the opening credits were a bit meta because Groot was posing for them while they're having this big battle. And it kept me thinking, oh god, are they going to do this to the whole movie? Like, it was a little obnoxious when they first did it. And they were still meta through the entire movie, but... It wasn't as obnoxious after the opening scene. The opening scene made me think, oh god, is this just going to be a total romp and a total parody of superhero movies? Is this going to have any semblance of the story? It, it does. It has a lot of semblance you know, with the story, at least the seriousness of it anyway. I don't think Guardians of the Galaxy, the comic, has so many meta jokes in it, but maybe that's just me. Who knows? I, I think there's just been this trend of people getting tired of the same stuff in every movie. This movie still has those things, for the most part, but it gets a bit meta. Quite a bit meta, if you ask me. Um, I think it's to its plus and to its downfall as well. Um, I think sometimes the meta-ness really took me out of the movie and just made me think, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right, but how do you know that? You know, how do you know that without addressing the movie viewer? You know, we don't we don't need to be told that we're in a movie. You know, we went to a movie theater to escape reality. You keep bringing me back. Why do you bring me back to reality? Like, I want to be immersed in your world for a couple hours. This is why I paid my money to go watch on the screen what you're doing. Maybe personal preference, who knows. But sometimes the meta-ness is clever and it is funny. I mean, you have these things, uh, just certain setups of, I don't know, you have the, you have Gamora and Chris Pratt and Chris Pratt is just like this unspoken thing. Like, uh, are you, are you gonna admit it or not? You know? And this is the cheers thing with like Sam and Diane and he keeps going on and on and on about cheers and, and Gamora is just like, I don't know what Cheers is! And I, I was just like, oh, good, good. Because not everyone's going to know what Cheers is. I know what Cheers is, but that doesn't mean I know all the characters. It, you know, you don't need to have seen a show to know certain aspects about a show. You don't. But, you know, I know, I know the guy from Becker, Ted Danson, was on Cheers. I know this actor, like, or the character named Cliff was on Cheers. That's my dad's name, my brother's name. I know it's in a bar that's in, the, like, the, the basement of sorts. Uh, you know, point being that even though I haven't seen Cheers very often, I, mean, I saw it in, like, five minutes of an episode, um, I still know things about Cheers. And, you know, it's nice seeing when they acknowledge certain things or if certain things are really silly... Like, there were certain lines that were said, and they're like, dude, why would you say that? There was, okay, there was a really funny part with uh, the raccoon uh, being, like, held captive. And the guy that took Yan Yandu's crew over is named Taserface. And the raccoon is just having the hardest of time keeping a straight face about it. He just starts laughing at this guy and just digs into him. And it is funny, but it's not my favorite part. Now, believe me, it gets better. Because, after all this time, and so you think the joke has worn off, and you know, the raccoon's always a smart ass anyway. He's always this kind of, oh, I'm so meta character. And, meanwhile, probably like 10 minutes after that, maybe 20, um, Taserface comes back onto the scene. And he relays information to the high priestess, okay? And, you know, he mentions something about, you know, you know, beware taser face. And she starts losing her mind. And it is so great because here's this, like, stoic woman that, like, you know, is very statuesque and has no emotion or anything whatsoever. She's not a wisecracker. She's always straight and to the point. 
and doesn't pull any shit. And she just loses it because of Taser Face. And you're just like, oh my god. <laughs> you made me actually laugh and not because I felt like I had to laugh. And that's not to say this whole movie made me feel like I had to laugh. It was just, you could tell some jokes were in there for the sole purpose of getting the audience to laugh. But with this, I actually had more of a, like an interaction with the character. And, and it was more of an impact with the character because even she couldn't keep a straight face. It was, it was that stupid to have a name of Taser Face. So I think my thing is the meta-ness works really well for the movie. It suits the movie very well. Um, yeah, it's a good fit. It makes sense. These guys are a bunch of goofballs and they're going to say stupid stuff. But at the same time, the men in this can kind of get to you and just take away from the experience and put you back into reality if that's not where you wanted to be for a while, you know? And some people love reality, and I just prefer to indulge in, I don't know, other things sometimes. I don't want to be in reality all the time. You need a little, I don't know, side place to really get your creative juices flowing instead of just sitting in your bunker all day. Maybe that's just me, though. In terms of how the rest of the movie plays out, you have a lot of explosions, a lot of visual effects. Yandu's got this really cool, like, arrow kind of thing that, like, goes around and just flies around basically anywhere. Like, basically, like, your, your, your Photoshop artist, like, best dream come to life ever. Uh, it just flies around and it kills off people left and right. And there are a lot of bad guys to kill off in this movie. A lot of bad faces. And so you're like, oh, that's good. That's a good use. Groot, baby Groot's pretty funny. They use him to really like get into small places. And that's more of a play off of how Chris Pratt was raised. He was used to be a thief and run around in small places. And you're like, okay, yeah, that's cool. Um... I feel like after I watch the first movie, I'm going to have more insight on, on Chris Pratt's character and all the other characters, too. Um, and Yando, for that matter. Um, Yando ends up sacrificing himself. That's a bummer. Um, didn't really understand why he did it. I think it was just more of like only one of them could be saved. He applied some stuff to Chris Pratt with like bubble wrap. <laughs> Maybe just want to like go and pop it, but I knew it was a bad idea for Chris Pratt, so I resisted. Um... And I guess the bubble wrap was only good for, like, was only there for one person, and so he chose Chris Pratt. Fair enough. Okay, that's that's cool. That makes more sense. Uh, but there's something else, and I don't know what, what to tell you. Um, then uh, they have a lot of adventures on this planet of ego. What what starts this whole trigger in doubting Kurt Russell for the other characters is that Nebula and Gamora come across this like cavern, and it has all these dead bodies, except. No one else is supposed to have lived on this planet. So that's that's a red flag right there. They're like, what's wrong? And oh god, where's where is my Chris Pratt? Like, is he gonna be okay? And at the current state, no, because at this point, uh, this is when Kurt Russell's done all this like grand vision of like just how great he is and how he's a god, you know, not not with a capital G, but he's a god. Yada yada yada, and he has his own planet and all this stuff, and all of this like wonder and amazement in terms of what Chris Pratt can do and all these things. And it looks cool. It looks cool, but you know something's a bit off. And Gamora's insane the whole time, and you're like, no, Gamora, you're just being bitchy. Like, what's your deal? And then Gamora's right. Of course she is. Of course Gamora's right. Um. Yeah. For me, I I liked the people in this movie. The effects were awesome. They were really fun. I had a lot of just enjoyment and like, you know, I was dazzled by this movie, you could say, with all the effects. Having the raccoon and just like the whole, the raccoon and the tree and the green lady and the Fantastic Four-esque guy, even though he was done way better. Uh, and Chris Pratt, and they made sure to include an, uh, an ab shot of Chris Pratt for all the people that would swoon at him. Uh, of course, I'm looking at you, Kayla. And uh, yeah, <laughs> and you have you know, everyone else. Kurt Russell is entertaining. He's he's a 
He's good at being a bad guy. <laughs> I was going to say good bad guy, but that doesn't, you know, that has some hypocrisy anyway. At least a touch of it, you know, like jumbo shrimp, or I guess an oxymoron is the better word for it. Um, yeah, in terms of, like, a grade, I'd probably say an A-. minus. Uh, honestly, I was thinking about an A, but it's just, like, it's, I don't know, it's, it's a little too much of meta for me. I really like the movie overall, though. That's not a bad thing. I just have a personal preference of not being reminded that I'm watching a movie. You know? I, I think good jokes are needed. And they had a lot of good jokes. They had a lot, in fact, a lot of them were great jokes. But sometimes it just kind of took me out of that, you know, that world. And that's not what I was looking for. Uh, but that being said, it's just like a really minor point, you know. Movie making was great. The effects were fun. The writing was witty. Uh, the characters were enjoyable. Uh, the bad guys were a lot of fun. Um, all the conflict that came up. All, like, the subplots worked in really well. I didn't really feel like there was anything left hanging the dry except for things that were always going to be set up in later movies they had an awesome fireworks show at the end as a like ravager's funeral you could say they had some cool planets going on that i didn't feel i had seen a million times uh, yeah it was really cool and really fun but maybe a touch meta so i was thinking a minus and yeah between like uh get out and guardians of the galaxy for the straight out of popcorn series I still like Get Out more. That's not to say Guardians of the Galaxy 2 was a bad movie. It was a great movie. Um, I think I just have this, this appreciation for this, you know, first-time filmmaker of Get Out that did a really solid blend of, of actual horror movie-esque things, but putting a different, a little bit of a different spin on it, like a, you could say like a Guess Who's Coming to Dinner or a Driving Miss Daisy combined with, uh, I don't know, like, your standard horror movie, but it was well-written. Uh, and that's my big thing on these movies, you know, is it well-written, and is it well-acted, and is it memorable? Does it look nice? Um, you know, those things. And so, really, this one's a hard thing. I think for me, though, these two movies, Get Out and Guardians of the Galaxy 2, were just, like, two different kinds of special nights, you know? There are some nights where I am in the mood uh, for, you know, one really kind of ritzy dinner. Like, you could say, like, a filet mignon kind of night. And then there's other nights where I'm really in the mood for, like, a nice, you know, rack of ribs. You know, it's all, like, you know, they're similar, but they are different. And sometimes I'm in the mood for one over the other. So... You know, you could probably flip-flop these two, but, you know, for my sake, I just picked uh, Get Out as the superior choice. But do not miss Guardians of the Galaxy 2. If you don't see it in theaters, you know, that's up to you. Uh, I didn't see the first one. I still haven't, so I don't hold that against people. I'm not one of those kinds of people, but um, I would say it's worth your while to go see, you know, now. And don't feel bad if you haven't seen the first one. You know, you can see the first one at a later time. Um, but this is definitely a fun watch on the big screen. And so I hope you all go see it. So I give it an A-. minus. All right. So this was a lot of fun to do. And hopefully y'all had fun watching this. And hopefully y'all go see this now. But um, if you don't, take some time whenever it comes on to whatever streaming source you use. Or if you're one of those uh, downloader kind of people, you know, do it then too. Uh, so anyway, not a waste of your time. All right, well, this was a lot of fun. I've been irking and, you know, waiting to get back to this for a while now, so I'm glad I could. And I hope y'all have a lot of fun and a good weekend. All right, I'll talk to y'all later. Bye.